Welcome to my CompTIA Security Plus lecture review. Here we're looking at the CompTIA Security Plus Guide to Network Security Fundamentals 5th edition written by Cengage. Here we're doing chapter 2 which focuses on malware and social engineering attacks. Objectives are to define malware, list the types of malware, identify payloads of malware, and describe the types of social engineering psychological attacks, also to explain physical social engineering attacks, sub attacks as well. So malware is really malicious software. It will enter a computer, typically without the uh, owner's knowledge or consent, and this uses a threat vector to deliver a payload of sorts. The payload will vary depending on the purpose of the malware. And again, it typically will be a harmful function once uh, it's called or uh, accessed. Malware is generally the term that refers to a wide variety of damaging or annoying software. Again, malicious software malware. Attackers can gain access. Sorry, an attacker can mask and the uh, the presence of malware by having it changed or having it manipulated so it will mimic another program. A common item might be you have malware and you embed it in an email or you embed it in a Word document or you embed it in a photo. You send it and then they uh, receive whatever document, photo you sent them. When they open it, they're now infected. So you can embed malware different ways. There are three common types of mutating malware. Polymorphic malware is completely uh, changed from its original uh, when it's executed. Metamorphic malware can rewrite its own code and thus appears different each time it's executed. Oligomorphic malware changes its internal code to a predefined mutation whenever executed. The issue is each of these has pros and cons, and you actually typically look at polymorphic and metamorphic malware because the goal here is to be uh, having its signature changed when ran. To help to keep it uh, from being detected. Malware can be classified using primary uh, traits that almost all malware has. That is the circulation, which is the how it spreads, the infection, and that's how it embeds itself, how it is concealed, and again that's avoiding detection, and then again lastly the payload capabilities which is the action of the malware. Circulation or infection. There are three types of malware that have primary traits for circulation, viruses, worms, and trojans. Those are types of malware. Typically, we'll talk about like a virus, and that doesn't normally mean that all viruses are malware or all malware are viruses. So, you got to keep that in mind. Viruses are typically classified as a type of malware. Malware is not a type of virus. Viruses can have different types of viruses. You can have a computer virus, which is malicious computer code. You can have a program virus, and that will infect an executable, like a rootkit. You can have a macro, which is actually a series of instructions grouped together so that when you run it, it will actually run the sequence of commands. Common data uh, file viruses is a micro is a macro, not micro, but macro virus that is written in a script. And then once ran, it runs that script. Virus infection and methods. It will actually append our infection, which will, the virus will append itself to the end of a file. 
That way, when you run the file, it executes the virus. Though, this is easily mitigated because this is easily found by virus scanners. Other infection methods could be Swiss cheese infection. This is where the virus injects themselves into an executable. The virus code is scrambled to make it harder to detect. Again, similar to a rootkit. Split infection. This is where the virus splits into several parts. Parts are placed at random positions in a host program, making it harder to detect. That way, because you don't see the entire code, the parts that uh, are unnecessarily garbage, you don't really understand its true purpose until you look at the overall code or structure. Here is an example of the split infection. You may have the entire program code, and you actually act, uh, have sections of code sparse throughout it. You may not understand the code, but as you start looking at the whole big picture, you can start seeing, okay, this is the junk code, which is actually really a sophisticated virus uh, that you didn't realize was there. Viruses perform two actions typically reproduce, and to upload a payload. Examples of virus actions could cause a computer to repeatedly crash, erase files, could turn off security settings, or it could be as simple as reformatting a hard drive. Typically, viruses cannot automatically spread to another computer. That's the purpose of a worm. So they relied on user actions to spread the virus. Viruses are attached to files typically, and they spread by transferring of those infected files. Worms don't need interaction to spread. This is a malicious program that uses a computer network to replicate itself. It will send copies of itself to other network devices. Worms may consume resources or leave behind a payload that could be harmful to the overall computer. Deleting files, allowing remote control. Uh, well, allowing remote control is one that's more of a Trojan. Trojan is an executable program, typically, that does something other than advertise. It, you may download Solitaire. And in reality, it may be Solitaire, but it may also allow remote access. Think of like a Trojan horse. It will mimic a free program, but in reality has a back door to allow an attacker to gain access. A, a rat, a remote access Trojan, is a very common type of Trojan, and that allows remote access. So basically, when you're looking at the different types, you have to ask yourself, what does it do? A virus versus a worm versus a Trojan, they are different. And how does it infect a file? How does it spread? They are all different depending on what type of malicious code it really is. Again, concealment. A rootkit is software that's used by an attacker to hide actions or preserve uh, the presence of other types of malware software. Again, it will conceal itself inside of an executable. Uh, very common, you'll have like Internet Explorer get hijacked, and that's a rootkit. It will hide in, in Internet Explorer. Basically, it will take the executable, modify it, and then become it. That way, when you open it, it will still run whatever executable, executable it is, but it will also perform other actions. It may alter or replace operating system files, again, common Internet Explorer, so that it can remain hidden. Users can no longer trust their computer that contains a rootkit because the rootkit could actually be any number of files that are on the system. Payload capabilities. Payload could be, uh, it's gonna collect data, delete data, modify data, or launch other types of attacks. Collecting data could be things like spyware or adware. Sometimes types of ransomware could also be there to collect data. 
The purpose of this is to, again, collect data. Spyware is software that gathers information without user's consent. Keylogger, it will capture keystrokes on a keyboard. That way you can replay them to uh, find out people's passwords and usernames or other information that they're typing. Keyloggers are always good because they can be hardware, they can be software, they could be a USB dongle, they can be many things. An advantage of key, uh, software keyloggers is you don't need physical access. You can actually just install the code and then have the code report back. Again, depending on what we're dealing with, automatic download, they could be passive, they could be active, it could be tracking software. It just kind of depends. And each technology has a different impact. Automatic downloading software could be used to install unauthorized access. Passive tracking technology, you can actually have it passively connect, sorry, passively collect private information. System modification, it could modify the system to a degree that you don't want to be able to use it. Tracking software again might track you. Adware, that's going to deliver advertisements to you every time like a, um, you do something. Or it could be random. My favorite is typically you'll see that Adware comes with certain nefarious websites, so you end up with opening up one website and then it pops up with additional ads. That could be a form of Adware. Ransomware, as I wouldn't always classify this in the collecting of data, but this will prevent a user's device from properly operating until a fee, to, a fee is paid. Again, I don't understand how this is collecting data. This is a type of malware, but typically not what I would classify as collecting. Honestly, ransomware is a growing threat and it's starting to cost billions of dollars a year. Ransomware is again a type of malicious code that you have to be mindful of. Collecting data, again, being able to have a program act like a legitimate program. Here might be the Windows 7 Internet Security, and this might find different types of ransomware. Or this could be the ransomware itself, because it could mimic security software that you don't realize is actually really the malware. Deleting of files is always a type of payload. Files or data is how we do work. Without the data, we can't really do anything. A common one is a logic bomb, and that is the code will lay dormant or the payload will lay dormant until a event occurs or a trigger occurs, and then the code is executed. This is a lot harder to detect because it will lay dormant until the criteria to no longer be dormant is executed or ran or met. Modifying the system security, again, back doors to allow access. Remote access, trojans are a good one. This allows accidental modification of systems, or maybe not accidental, so that you gain access to the system. We have some type of launch of attacks. You could have a zombie computer, which could be part of a botnet or a bot herder, which is actually a bot herder is actually the control of the botnet computers. Typically, they respond to a command and control server called the CNC. The command and control server will say to do a specific task, and then the infected items will do the, execute, the appropriate commands. Other types of attacks could be like spam, could be manipulating online polls, could be a denial of service, could be as simple as spreading additional malware. So that kind of gives us the intro to malware. Moving on, 
Social engineering attacks. Social engineering is the means of gathering information for an attack by relying on weaknesses of individuals, not technical controls, but people. Social engineering attacks can involve psychological approaches as well as physical procedures. It could be as simple as asking a person, hey, what's your password? And to see what they do. So the psychological approach could be uh, to persuade victims to provide information or to take action. It could be as simple as asking someone to get the door for you. Especially if you don't have permission to access the, uh, the location, them holding the door open for you could be a violation. Attackers use a variety of techniques to gain trust without moving quickly. Sometimes this is about a long-term uh, endeavor, not short-term. Attackers will ask for small amounts of information at first, possibly. The request needs to be believable. You can use slight flattery or uh, flirtation to kind of help soften up the victim. You could drop some names, like a, a key figure. You might be their assistant and you're trying to do work for them. You know, maybe you need to call them so that you can get into this person's office. Uh, you can always push a little bit to kind of see what you can get access to. Lastly, the attackers may smile and ask for help. Just kind of depends. Impersonation is always a big one. You can always pretend to be someone else. Here, you, uh, I'm in Las Vegas. And uh, if you're an AC technician, more often than not, they'll let you in. If you work for the, an ISP, they'll let you in. They won't question it. They'll just give you access. Or you could follow a fellow employee. Attackers will often impersonate a person with authority because victims generally resist saying no to anyone that has any type of power. Phishing is sending an email claiming the being a, from a legitimate source. Basically, you're trying to trick users into doing something. Many phishing attacks will have a, a web link or a logo or an urgent request. Hey, your password was compromised. Click here to reset your email password. And in reality, the clicking there is the nefarious website that causes the breach or causes the issue. Variation of the phishing attacks do occur. Some uh, farming might be an automatic redirect uh, for users to a fraudulent website. My favorite one is I got an email from my bank, Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, W-E-L-L -L, Fargo. And the email was actually from support at Well Fargo. W-E-L Fargo. And uh, when you clicked on it, it redirected you to wellfargo.com. It looked like Wells Fargo's website, but it had one missing L. But it looked identical. And then again, it had the login to your online banking. And uh, if I were to proceed with doing it, if I'd actually enter my credentials, what it would do is basically say, hey, we're down for maintenance, yada, 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 try again later. But in reality, what it did was it took my username and password and the system is now logging into the real as well as Fargo website to clean out my bank account. So again, farming is an automatic redirection to a, a fraudulent website, which typically is one that looks legit. Spear phishing it deals with email messages that target specific users. Welling typically goes after the uh, big fish or wealthier individuals. Finishing, uh, voice phishing, attackers might, record, uh, might call you and try to get you to call them back. Uh, I've had that one from an ISP multiple times. Hey, your account is in peril. It's been past due. We're sending it to collection to give us a call so we can prevent this. Here's an example of a phishing email from PayPal. This is a fake uh, email. Dear PayPal user, it will sound of some urgency. It will give you links to it. This is fake. 
Spam is unsolicited emails, and they can come from numerous uh, sources. Image spam could be uh, graphic images uh, of text in order to circumvent text-based uh, filters. So that's always a good one. So instead of sending text, they're sending images. Or uh, in certain areas, they're actually doing uh, spamming penises so that if you're uh, in a crowded bus or train and you have, uh, I know it happens on iPhone, but it also happens on Android as well, but you can use AirDrop to send uh, spam to people, photos. And here they're just, at least in New York, it's very common that they uh, spam penis photos. Again, here's an example of spam. I get this one constantly for Viagra and Cialis. Hoaxes are for, uh, false warnings. Normally, they're pretending to be from the IT department, and they're, again, trying to get you to do a specific task. Typo squatting. This redirects a user to a fictitious website based off of a misspelling of a URL. Example, Google, G-O-O-G-L-E, versus G-O-O-O-G-L-E. Though, Google uh, was very... Uh, adamant about squashing the type of typo squatting. So Google bought variations of Google's name so that you don't get redirected to a, a fake website. G-O-G-G-L-E might uh, redirect you to Google or it may not. I'm almost again positive Google bought every variation of Google's name to prevent this from happening. Though, not everyone does it. Watering, watering hole attacks is a type of malicious attack that is directed towards a small group of specific individuals who visit the same website. Major executives, for example, uh, could be the source of an attack. Moving on, physical types of attacks could be things like dumpster diving or tailgating. Dumpster diving is going through the garbage can to get information. Tailgating, also known as, sorry, tailgating is going to be a big one. That's where you're going in behind someone, following them. They unlock the door and you kind of get in there right behind them. If it's a secured location, each person should have to sign, scan their badge to gain access, though they've already shown that people will hold the door open for people, especially if you do something. Uh, sometimes called piggybacking, you could actually walk in with donuts, follow someone with your hands full. People get the door for you. If you're looking at, uh, if there's a pin code, someone could be looking over your shoulder. That's called shoulder surfing. Again, spamming, uh, spreading a malicious code, you know, all types of attacks. And that is actually chapter two in a nutshell. We talked about the different types of malware. We talked about the purpose of malware, spyware, adware, ransomware, Trojan worms and viruses. We talked about uh, logic bombs, popular payloads, botnet, zombies, command and control servers. And then we ended up with social engineering, uh, typo squatting, and types of tailgating. That is chapter two in a nutshell. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.